With a record of $16 billion worth of profits for their clients in 2022, Citadel is the most successful hedge fund today. Ken Griffin is the richest man. Ken Griffin. Griffin's $30 billion. Spent over a billion dollars on real estate. True. What's interesting about this one is the odd mix of politics and finance. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. Hop in my car and a giddy up. Secure the bag, yeah, I get the bus. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. Hop in my car and a giddy up. Secure the bag, yeah, I get the bus. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Back in 2021, Ken Griffin was forced to appear in front of Congress and testify, giving us one of the interviews that many people would not soon forget. Well, I understand that, but did you talk to them about restricting or doing anything to prevent people from buying, not selling, but buying GameStop? Let me be- Anybody in your organization? Let me be perfectly clear. Absolutely not. But we'll get back to that. For now, let's start here. Who is Ken Griffin? As a child growing up in South Florida during the 1980s, Griffin had a natural inclination towards technology. A standout student at Boca Raton Community High School, he excelled in math and was the president of a math club. He also worked part-time at IBM and started a software business that sold educational programs at a discount to professors. The kid was way ahead of his time. Here's a report that I wrote in sixth grade where I set out to understand how the stock market works. With a background in entrepreneurship, Griffin's maternal grandparents had a successful regional fuel oil company as well as farms and a seed business. Griffin's first experience with the stock market was was in 1987 when he was a freshman at Harvard University. He read an article in Forbes that raised questions about the performance of a new company, the Home Shopping Network. The legend is that you began trading convertible bonds out of your dorm room. Is that true or not? My freshman year, there was an article in Forbes on how Home Shopping Network was overpriced. He purchased put options, betting that the stock would fall and made a few thousand dollars when it did. Having read this article, I went and bought two put contracts in Home Shopping Network, and lo and behold, the stock cratered like 30 or 40 percent shortly after I bought these puts. And when you make a few thousand dollars as a freshman, uh, you are rich. This is the moment you have dreamed of. While still a student at Harvard, Ken Griffin discovered that there are many mispricing opportunities with convertible bonds using his own pricing model. Following that, he created his own algorithm to flag these mispricing bonds. He later installed a satellite dish on his roof of his dorm to receive real-time quotes directly from his IBM PC. The supervisor of the building gave me permission to put a satellite dish on top of the building so that I could have real-time stock quotes. So now you're probably wondering, how does a boy genius, one of the most intelligent and entrepreneurial young talents of this generation, be become hated in the eyes of retail investors. By the way, I don't like how you guys couch language on this show. You guys will use words like retail investor. Yeah. I don't like that word. <laughs> it's the same you way they used to write about, you, they used to write, write about rap music. They called it urban music. I'm uh, like, what do you want? Some retail like, investor, sucker. urban music. You're saying the same thing, <laughs> poor people. I get sucker. it. We're just getting close to the good parts, so let's keep it going. Ken Griffin went over his first investor, a friend in the broking industry, by explaining his idea for convertible bond arbitrage. This was a remarkable achievement for the young entrepreneur and would pave the way to his future success in the industry. Well, I called a broker at First Boston to ask for advice on this strategy that I came across. And this gentleman, Doug Snyder, was quite generous with his time. And he said, look, this is really not a strategy that our clients do, but the firm does it with, its, with our own money. Now, I may have been young, I may have been naive, but I was no fool. If this is good enough for the firm's money, this is what I want to do with my money. So with two friends, we started a small hedge fund in 1987. As many people know on Wall Street, you don't only have to be good, sometimes you have to be lucky. And Ken Griffin was often very lucky. One, find that tip on Forbes for his first put contract. Two, getting his first investment of 50 grand from a friend in the broking industry, which kicked off his first fund for $265,000. We raised $265,000 from friends and family. And three, Black Monday. Good evening. Today is Black Monday, the day the Dow dropped more than 500 points. The day the Dow dropped more than 22 percent, almost double the rate of the Black Monday that signaled the beginning of the crash of 1929. But this crash of 1987 is not just an American experience. Around the world, stock markets fell faster than a skydiver without a parachute. Black Monday, where half of Wall Street was getting killed, the wolf of Wall Street lost his job at LF Rothschild. Ken Griffin and his fund in his dorm room was killing the game. And yes, I started it in my dorm room. Okay, so let's pick it up a little bit. Here's where Citadel was almost closed down forever, the 2008 crash. And the bell has sounded, bringing to a close an extraordinary day on Wall Street. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the closing bell. I'm Maria Bar to Romo today in London. The rescue of Bear Stearns dominating the entire trading day on Wall Street, leading the market lower right from the get-go. 
Tonight, the Dow Jones Industrial Average finishes the week and the day with a decline on the session of 191 points. Another ugly day for stocks. You see, up until this point, Ken Griffin's resume was spotless to the point where he might have been overconfident. And not foreseeing the financial crisis of 2008 was the greatest mistake of my career. You see, we are paid to see the unforeseen. And I did not grasp the magnitude and depth of the financial crisis that was growing in our banking system. A crisis so large that virtually every bank in America would have failed if the government had not intervened. Every bank would have failed. We were losing hundreds of millions of dollars a week, if not more. By the end of 2008, we had lost half our capital, but we were still in business and we kept our team, and our team kept fighting to buy us another day. You see, with the right people, with the ability to execute, and with the willingness to make the tough decisions, we were able to save our firm. Coming out of 2009, Citadel would more than bounce back from this crisis, making money hand over fist as the stock market would run up over 400% over the next 10 years. Making money with both Citadel and Citadel Securities, the market maker, Ken Griffin was having quite a time heading into another Black Swan event, the pandemic. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation where there is not a cause for alarm. Now we all know how this goes. The world starts spinning, there's massive shutdowns, everyone's stuck at home, and the funny thing happens, people start to pay a little bit more attention to their finances. And well, Keith Gill was born. Yeah, that's it. All right, so thanks, thanks Nicholas, thanks Nick for tuning in. And I think that if there's a couple other viewers too, thanks so much for tuning in, I really appreciate it. It's nice to have people tuning in for this, but uh, it's just, um, yeah, I hope you had a good time and uh, hope maybe see you on the next stream as well. But otherwise, thanks for tuning in and have a nice night. Cheers. Now I gotta learn how to, this is my first time ending a stream. <laughs> I don't even know how to end the stream. I think I just click end stream over here. I think. I don't know. Now, nobody could have guessed what would have happened next. Well, with the exception of, of course, some self-proclaimed DJs on Reddit, they knew exactly what was going to happen. But outside of that, on an institutional level, and of course, from mainstream media, nobody knew what was coming next. In my personal opinion, Keith Gill was the fuse that lit the match to opening the minds of several different retail investors and definitely putting some pressure on some institutional investors, i.e. hedge funds. Of course, this video is not going to be specifically about the short squeeze and or Keith Gill, although I will be doing deep dives on several different people, so I will definitely covering Keith Gill at some point in time. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you'll get notified when that does happen. Let's keep it going. What seems like overnight, retail investors that had historically been exit liquidity for institutional investors had taken institutions by the balls. I've never seen it before. And what Wall Street bets, which is really driving this, what they've done, that's a site on Reddit, what they've done is target large short positions. I'm not, I actually think, uh, Herb, that they're smarter than we think. They're after the ones that are too shorted. No, short selling is not dead, but they're very smart about what to target. Wait a minute, what you just said, target. <laughs> so here's my question. How is it that they can target and that's legal? And if there was in the old days, a bear raid, that was illegal. When does this become manipulation, Jim? It's such a tough question because remember, What's manipulation? How about if an analyst came out right now and said, I think GameStop is going to 250? Would we give that uh, person a, a pass? Yes, because of the very First different. Amendment. Very, no, very, no, very, listen very to me. Different. It's First Amendment protection versus the idea of a group getting together to bust the shorts. But if the group is not a real group, it's just a lot of people who love it, it's going to be very hard for the U.S. attorney to do anything, Herb. What is it, the SEC? They're not, they're, what kind of case do they have? We like the stock. We like the stock. I mean, that's, that's the case. Ryan Cohen got so, in. He bought 15% at $8. He's on the board. We like the stock. How is that bad? Or do you think that they're concentrated and doing some sort of manipulation if they say they like the stock? Well, I don't know if they're concentrated because I don't have subpoena power and I can't really go well, out and look at it. that's always been your I problem. Even, I, I, can, I can argue, I don't even know if there are foreign powers that work here behind Please the scenes stop. trying to make chaos off our market. It got to a point where even some of the best hedge funds or best traders out there were still caught slipping. He was the top trader for Steve Cohen's fund, SAC, and then he started his own shop in 2014 called Melvin Capital, named after his grandfather. And since then, 
Melvin has returned some of the most impressive numbers in the hedge fund industry. And good research. Now you see, through this whole situation, when people start making money hand over fist, more money than they ever made before in their lives, especially in the financial markets, and hedge funds started losing more money than they ever lost before, especially in the financial markets, that's when retail investors really start to figure out who Ken Griffin was. Currency press conference time. Maybe the craziest one that I've ever done. What is going on on Wall Street? The way they have absolutely cheated, stolen, robbed, everyday people who have been investing with Robinhood and other E-Trade accounts and all this stuff by saying, hey, hedge funds are getting smoked. Billionaires are getting smoked. So we're no longer going to let you trade on certain stocks, GMC, AMC, NOC. We're just shutting it off. You can't buy those stocks anymore. You can only sell them. We are going to crash that those stocks so all our hedge fund billionaire friends can get out and not get killed. It is one of the most remarkable, illegal, shocking robberies in the history, in plain sight, in plain sight, no closed door meetings, nothing behind, just right in your face, putting a gun in your mouth and saying, give us all your money. That is what Robin Hood, Crooks, Jail, The Citadel, Ken Griffin, Jail, Steve Cohen, the Mets owner, Jail, are doing. They couldn't take that people on Wall Street Bets, Reddit, DDTG, fairly, open trade saying, we're going to buy this stock, fair and square. We know there's risk. It's going up. We know we're risking our own money, but we want to do it. To then say, sorry, you can't do this anymore. We are going to crash and tank the market because our billionaire hedge funds have shorted these and we don't want them to lose. Suddenly, volatility, we can't let you do it. We can't let you invest and put your money at risk. They have no problem with the hedge funds do it. When the hedge funds risk their firms and their livelihoods, that's fine. But oh, no, no, no. When the everyday Jimmy and Joe wants to do it, it's a problem. We to protect you they are robbing you they are stealing from you this is criminal the robin hood ceos they belong in jail ken griffin i just posted an article he made 6.7 billion on the volatility of the pandemic oh keep it rolling now the volatility is a problem because they're losing jail this is criminal this is criminal and the scariest thing is it's in plain sight. Now, there are a lot of different moving pieces here and each individual piece could deserve its own video. But that being said, stealing of the buy button was definitely one of the biggest moments and one of the most criminal moments in financial history. Allegedly, Ken Griffin and Robinhood have worked behind the scenes in order to cut off the buy button from several different retail investors, which did kick off the buy button being stolen from several other institutions once that domino was put into effect. Now, the question is, why stick your neck out so far for different hedge funds and firms like the one with Gabe Plotkin? I personally do believe that it was more so an attack on retail investors as a whole and to protect the billionaire friends, but also the fact that there was money given back to Gabe Plot in order to kind of get him off his feet made me feel like Ken Griffin might have seen a little bit of himself in 2008 in Gabe Plotkin with this issue. As if he was thinking, you, you see, see, with, with the, the right, right people, people with, with the ability, ability to execute, execute and with, with the, the willingness, willingness to, to make the, the tough, tough decisions, we were, were able to save our firm. firm. Following this debacle, Ken Griffin and Vlad Tenev, the CEO of Robinhood, did have to appear in front of Congress and of course lie, uh, lie out their case. Well, I understand that, but did you talk to them about restricting or doing anything to prevent people from buying, not selling, but buying GameStop? Let me be anybody in your organization. Let me be perfectly clear. Absolutely not. Mr. Teneve, you explained that Robinhood restricted transactions in certain securities to meet demands coming from your clearinghouse. And yet, on January 28th, you represented uh, to the media that there was no uh, liquidity problem. Isn't it true that being concerned about having enough capital uh, to meet deposit requirements, isn't that a liquidity problem? Or could you just answer yes or no? Chairwoman Waters, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. Just yes or no? We always felt comfortable with our liquidity and the additional capital that Robinhood raised. Please answer yes or no. We always I felt get through my five liquidity. minutes. I don't have time. I just need a yes or no answer. I, I stand by my statement. The additional capital we raised wasn't to meet capital requirements or deposit so requirements. The Excuse me. I'm reclaiming my time. Now, at this time, I hope you guys have a much better understanding of who Ken Griffin is, where he came from, what he's been up to. And of course, stay tuned for part two, which will basically break down what happened at the end of 2022 going into 2023, where he did just crack a new record of having profited over $16 billion with his hedge fund, much larger than what he profited in 2021, which is also a record 
for his hedge fund. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. If you guys have not yet, guys, of course, smash that like button, engage with the video, subscribe to the channel because I will be posting more quality content probably once a month, if not every two weeks on this channel. Hope you guys enjoy. Catch you guys in the next one. Deuces. Given all the conspiracy theories, though, that were raised uh, on social media and the implications of that, I'm curious, in retrospect, you obviously made a big investment in, in Melvin in the middle of this, Melvin Capital. Do you think that was a mistake? No, I think Gabe Plotkin is one of the finest investors of his generation. But, but, but given what the public perception became uh, around this idea that, that, that Citadel was behind uh, Plotkin on one side, behind Robin Hood on the other, in retrospect, do you, do you think it, it created a perception of a conflict? If I had to run my business to the possibility of an insane conspiracy theory emerging at any point in time, I would have no business.